Uh, hi, hi, everybody. I am the application performance lead at, at NERSC. And so I'm going to kind of give you an introduction to the Perlmutter system, a little bit about programming GPUs and like the different programming models and languages, libraries, frameworks that are available on Perlmutter. And um, I think we'll close here with just a few early science stories to maybe motivate the, the audience uh, with what what can and kind of has been done on the on the system already. I think as Helen um, pointed out, if you have questions, put them in the in the Google Doc. I think we're doing that because um, then the questions kind of stay after the after the Zoom meeting is is over. Um, okay, so let me kind of put Perlmutter in perspective. So this is the nurse system roadmap. Um, and one of the things I want to highlight here is that we're we're kind of in this transition from what was kind of pretty typical HPC systems a decade ago with Edison being a um, kind of a multi-core CPU-based system um, replicated across, you know, thousands of nodes to, to make an HPC, um, an HPC architecture. We've started this transition towards sort of energy efficient exascale like architectures in order to kind of meet the demands of the community. We started that transition with Cori, uh, which was powered by Intel Xeon Phi processors. And then with Perlmutter, we have um, our first ever GPU accelerated system. Um, and uh, we're thinking we're kind of already beginning the process to procure the NERS 10 system, which I think is expected in like the 2025, 2026, uh, 2026 timeframe. There's not much we can say about that, but I think we're expecting this trend towards these energy efficient architectures to continue. Um, so if you look at Perlmutter, um, we have two types of nodes. We have first the, NVIDIA AMD, or NVIDIA Ampere, I should say, uh, GPU powered nodes, each of which has four GPUs and one CPU um, per, per node. And they have a tremendous amount of performance in the, in the node you can see here over 75, um, uh, I guess, I guess that says teraflops, but I think that's a, um, Low, lower number. Um, and then we have these AMD Milan CPU nodes, which are don't have the GPUs, but do have two CPUs, uh, 256 uh, gigabytes of DDR. So a little bit more um, DDR per node, but you don't have the high bandwidth memory that comes with the, with the GPUs on those. Um, the, <clears throat> the system as a whole has 1,500 uh, GPU nodes, again, those, those are nodes with one CPU, the AMD Milan CPU, and four NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Um, and then it has 3,000 CPU-only nodes. Um, and it may seem like there's a lot more uh, CPU, CPU nodes than GPU nodes, but keep in mind that most of the actual performance of the system, or like most of the total available flops come from those GPU powered um, powered nodes. Oops. Um, so you can see that that sort of here um, in terms of the in terms of the performance. If you look at the performance of this of the GPU nodes, you have uh, you know about 120 total petaflops. I think that's the right number. Um, if you include the the power um, and capability of the tensor cores within the within the GPUs um, compared to about, uh, you know, close to, I guess, eight petaflops for the, for the CPU nodes. Um, this top row here where my mouse is, is showing the performance of the CPUs that are within the GPU node. So if you ignore the GPUs, you have another, a little bit of, uh, about, about four um, more peta, petaflops of, of performance. Um, so here's actually a picture of what the system looks like. Um, it's all downstairs in the building that I'm talking to you from. Um, and you can find even more details about the, uh, the architecture and the, um, 
the different components um, at this URL here. I'm going to talk a little bit more just about the different about the two types of nodes. So um, as I mentioned, most of the performance on the system comes from the GPU nodes. Um, and I mentioned that you have one AMD Milan processor, so that's pictured here, with uh, four NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Those are the four Ampere uh, GPUs pictured here. Um, the, the CPU and GPU are connected with a PCI Express 4 um, bus, uh, but the GPUs are connected to each other via a NVLink connection. And so I think that's what's pictured here in the green and then down here, these, these arrows uh, in, the, in the below diagram. Uh, each GPU has 40 gigabytes of high bandwidth me uh, memory. So that's um, a pretty big boost from the previous generation where you were looking at, you know, typically on the order of like maybe 16 gigabytes per, per GPU. Um, and that the, one of the important things about the GPUs is that uh, that memory comes with very, very high bandwidth. So you're able to achieve, um, you know, close to 1600 gigabytes per second of GPU bandwidth. Um, and uh, it, in, importantly, as I'm going to kind of discuss in a minute, that bandwidth is much higher than what you get uh, by uh, com compared to what you get by moving data across that PCI Express bus between the CPU and the and the GPUs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then uh, the the CPU node here looks a little bit simpler. So you have two AMD Milan um, processors. Um, each one of those is a 64 core um, part. They support AVX2 instructions. Um, similar, but not quite as high of a, of a vector width as you had on the Intel Xeon Phi processor for, for Cori. Um, and uh, they do have relatively high memory bandwidth for uh, C, for C, for CPU, you see that you have 204 uh, gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, um, but of course that's significantly lower than that memory bandwidth that you saw on the on the um, GPUs. Uh, the, the other part of the system that I really want to highlight today is the old Flash file system. So the Scratch file system on Perlmutter is made out of entirely um, uh, flash, so these NVMe uh, SSDs that you see here on the bottom. Uh, there's 35 petabytes total in the system. Um, it can support an aggregate bandwidth up to five terabytes per second, five million IOPS. Um, and um, you know, here are some of the other characteristics of the parallel file system, including the number of metadata servers and IO servers. Um, unlike with Cori, where you had this sort of uh, spinning disk based flash a uh, spinning disk based scratch file system combined with a burst buffer, uh, just everything on Perlmutter is scratch or is flash, which we think is, um, you know, a kind of a nice usability improvement. Um, so one of the things that I want to highlight here is, is uh, that we together with you all in the community kind of have this common challenge, which is to enable all of these different science um, users and codes to run efficiently on these advanced architectures, uh, including Cori and now moving on to Perlmutter and then eventually to the NERSC 10 system. Um, and here is sort of like a side-by-side -side comparison of what that challenge looks like in this generation. Um, moving from Cori, the Cori system to Perlmutter. So uh, we've, we're, we're moving up significantly in the total capability um, of the system. Um, significantly more memory. Uh, one of the real big differences is the performance per node has gone up dramatically on Perlmutter compared to Cori. These nodes are much, much more dense in terms of their compute power. Uh, you see from about three teraflops to 70 teraflops. Um, the, the node performance uh, or the, the processors um, now include the accelerator, 
the number of nodes has actually shrunk, I think, and that's consistent with the, the nodes themselves being more powerful. Um, and the, the other thing I would highlight is this all flash file system. Um, I think actually is one of the things that makes running on Perlmutter even, you know, perhaps e a little bit easier than, than it was on, on Cori. Um, <laughs> so we, um, we kind of started this process of uh, when, you, when we were thinking about kind of procuring a GPU system, we were looking at our workload and, and asking ourselves what fraction of the workload could really take advantage of the GPUs. And this is where things sort of stood in the 2017, 2018 timeframe. Um, and uh, the good news is because GPUs had been around at a number of different facilities and had been used different places throughout the world, a number of codes had uh, GPU versions um, available already, uh, but a number of applications um, were also kind of only partly ported or, or hadn't uh, even, even kind of started in, in some cases. And so we've been working with these code teams, you know, with a number of code teams over the last um, you know, five, five, five years or so to make sure that they um, would be ready for, for Perlmutter. Um, and, uh, you know, some of what I want to tell you about today is what we've learned from that process and, and sort of what um, some of those lessons are that you can kind of um, uh, learn, learn from as well. Um, so in, in general, um, as you're thinking about a CPU to GPU transition for an, an application, one of the ways to think about this is through this analogy that I'm showing on this slide that a, you know, a CPU is something like a Ferrari. I think, that, I think this is supposed to be a, a Ferrari on this, on this picture. And that's like, it's, uh, um, a, a car that it can go really fast, make really tight turns, um, but is really good for kind of doing one one task at a time or taking one person to kind of one place at a time, where a GPU is something like a, you know this double decker bus, which is uh, kind of good at going, uh, taking a lot a lot of different people to one place. Um, not as fast as the CPU would take an individual, but with a higher overall through throughput. Um, and this is kind of evident if you compare the amount of parallelism that is available um, in a CPU from our Cori system. So this is the, the Cori Haswell partition compared to a GPU on Perlmutter. So if you think about the two sockets of a one of the Corey Haswell nodes, you have 64 compute cores. Uh, each one of those can support up to two threads via Intel's hyper-threading technology. And if you were to use those AVX2 instructions, um, you can compute on two by 256 bit vectors at a time. Um, so that all adds up to about 2,000 way parallelism that a Haswell CPU node is uh, sort of capable of. Now, if you compare that to a single A100 GPU, um, the equivalent of the 64 cores is, is, is basically these 108 SMs or what they call streaming multiprocessors on a GPU. And each one of those can support up to 64 warps per e per SM. Um, only two can be active at a time, but you really want to generally oversubscribe the number of warps per SM to, to keep the, the GPU busy. And then within each one of those warps, um, you have 32 SIMT lanes per warp. So if we do the math here, that adds up to, or I guess multiplies up to 200,000 way parallelism. Um, which is, of course, like an order of magnitude bigger than, um, you know, I guess, two orders of magnitude bigger than what you see on the on the CPU node. Um, and this is what I, I had said verbally: is that you typically want to oversubscribe the GPUs in order to um, keep keep them busy and, and hide any latency. Um, <laughs> so, 
Another big difference between a, the CPU and the GPU is the memory bandwidth. So if you if you look at the uh, Haswell CPU, uh, you we had 128 gigabytes of DDR per node, and approximately 120 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth on that Haswell CPU node. Now, if you compare that to a single A100 GPU again, we have 40 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory, uh, but significantly higher uh, memory bandwidth, so 1,500 gigabytes a second, so in, an increase in an order of magnitude again. Um, now, uh, as I was highlighting when I was kind of talking about the architecture, um, this should be compared against the speed of moving data between the CPU and GPU across the PCI Express bus. And that is about 32 gigabytes a second. Um, and so you can see you can move data within the GPU very, very fast, but moving data across the CPU to GPU can be very slow. So the lesson learned here is to try to avoid moving data back and forth frequently. Um, and in general, the challenge for um, optimizing an application or bringing an application to the GPU is that there can be kind of multiple GPU optimization avenues. Um, so the two themes that I just highlighted are you need orders of magnitude more parallelism uh, and uh, you need to recognize that while the GPU memory is very fast, moving data back and forth is very slow. Um, and then there are, of course, other like second order considerations here, are, like just kind of two examples um, in that there is some overhead in launching kernels or like bits of code to run on the GPU. And so you want to make sure that you're giving the GPU kind of enough uh, contiguous work to, to work on. Um, and even though the memory on the GPU is fast, you still want to take advantage of cache and um, registers and shared memory as much as possible. So we've kind of realized that this uh, can be kind of like a multi-access, uh, multi, a problem that kind of has multiple accesses that you need to kind of understand your performance on. And so one of the things that we've been working with our vendor partners on is putting together some tools that help you kind of quickly profile your application and understand what's limiting your performance. So we've worked with NVIDIA in particular on their Insight uh, profiling tool. And uh, it now integrates uh, the what we call the roofline performance model, which will kind of plot your application performance on this sort of two-dimensional plot that considers your uh, kind of the characteristics of your algorithm in terms of the data movement versus the compute required and shows you kind of where you stand against what we would expect for that particular, for an algorithm of that characteristic. Um, and from, from there, you can then kind of devise a strategy for improving your overall performance. And so this is something that's baked into the tools that you can use here now at NERSC. Um, so our strategy over the last several years as part of this program called NESAP, which stands for the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program, has been to partner with a number of application teams um, to work with them to prepare for Perlmutter at a pretty, at a pretty deep level and then um, to take what we've learned there and kind of share with you the share, share with kind of everybody in the community um, the lessons learned and kind of best practices through kind of training events like this and various hackathons that are available um, throughout the, the country. Um, this I just wanted to kind, kind of highlight was an all hands on deck activity. A number of the people who you see here um, will be kind of available in the afternoon to um, work with you and to kind of talk with you about your own applications. Um, and one of the things I really want to highlight here is that these hackathons have been really effective in um, kind of helping improve various code teams around the country. Um, the 
we've had sort of two types. The first type is sort of uh, now, now wrapping up. It was kind of part of the nurse project itself. But the second one is the these public GPU hackathons that anybody and everybody can go apply to become a team at um, at this URL. And uh, you know we've actually provided more mentors, I think, than any other institution in the world to these uh, to these hackathons. And so we'd love to kind of actually work with you at hackathons um, all around the all around the country um, and to a certain extent all around the world. So these are. Uh, organized by uh, NVIDIA, Oak Ridge National Lab, and uh, and us here at NERSC. Um, and I think there's, there's, I think, probably on the average of one a month within like North America. Um, and so really, one of the, one of my kind of take home messages today is go check out this URL. And if you think you really want to deep dive into your application and um, optimizing it for GPUs, I think these can be really, really good, good events. Um, and so, just an example of how this worked with like one of these, uh, one of these applications. Um, if you look at Lamps, so Lamps is a molecular dynamics application that's used for kind of materials modeling. Um, you can see their performance here, sort of over time as uh, they were working on this application and optimizing it towards GPUs. And um, the, one of the things I want to highlight is sort of like the speed ups that they obtain um, are sort of centered around uh, these, these different hackathon events where they were able to make significant difference in just a few days by attending a hackathon and then continuing on those improvements and then attending another hackathon and making significantly more, um, more improvements. Um, and this actually led the team to um, do some really large scale science runs um, on uh, both uh, Perlmutter and uh, other, other GPU systems available uh, that I don't think really could have been done without the Without this new system itself and the work that the team put into the to the to the project, um, so uh, yeah. So the one you know one of the other things I wanted to highlight is that we've been working with teams to do really large scale science um, runs on uh, Perlmutter and related GPU systems over the last several years. Um, and one of the outcomes is uh, these really kind of large scale state of the art science calculations that are recognized each year at the supercomputing conference as um, Gordon Bell Prize finalists, or in some cases, in some cases, winners. Um, so just some observations about this process is I think that you know, many applications have been successful in preparing for Perlmutter, and we'd really like to keep engaging with uh, with you all in the community to enable um, uh, you all to basically use the system productively. And uh, we really do encourage everyone to join these community hackathons, uh, gpuhackathons.org. I think that's just a great way to um, to get a lot done done quickly. Um, and we do kind of recognize that there. You know, moving, uh, you know, optimizing your application for GPUs is um, not a kind of linear, one size fits all solution. There's kind of multiple optimization angles that exist. And uh, kind of profiling and using the roofline tool that I highlighted is a great way to get started. Um, the, the other thing that I would just note here at the end is that I, I really think that we've seen a lot of. Uh, energy coming from you all, the, the community, who is um, really excited about the potential of of Perlmutter, and um, I think that's really great to see, and it's uh, um, something that um, we are really really excited about as well. Um, so I want to now change. So I think I'm. Um, uh, Kind of moving into the second part of this this talk, and I think I'll try to not go over my time too much here. 
Uh, and I just want to talk about some of like the the programming environment that is available on Perlmutter for everybody to, to use. And so one of the things that um, I want to highlight about Perlmutter is that compared to um, some of the other GPU systems out there that are not that, that with using GPUs from vendors that are not quite as mature maybe as the NVIDIA, um, the NVIDIA parts, uh, we have essentially support for every single GPU programming model out there on, on Perlmutter. So um, we support uh, um, Fortran and we recognize that some of the applications are written in CUDA Fortran and you can use those on Perlmutter. We realize that a lot of applications out there are written in CUDA and you can use those on Perlmutter uh, and, and also OpenACC, for example, like VASP is a is an important application that's written in OpenACC. Um, and then um, we also realize that um, people have invested a lot in OpenNP in their applications for Cori. And uh, one of the things that we are happy with, you know, happy to, to say about Perlmutter is that you can kind of transition those OpenNP codes and uh, target the GPUs with the new OpenMP 5.x standard. Um, and then for more kind of modern C, C, uh, C++ applications, you could use these uh, frameworks like Cocos, Raja, and even DPC++ and Sickle to run on the, on the system as well. Um, we also have a pretty robust programming environment around data and analytics. Um, uh, Helen had highlighted uh, using Jupyter to log on to the system. And of course, Python and uh, the NVIDIA Rapid Stack are supported. And, uh, you know, PyTorch and, and TensorFlow, uh, two of the, 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 the more important um, machine learning frameworks are also really well optimized for the system. Um, we have a set of debuggers and uh, profilers that I highlight here. Uh, in particular, in, uh, including the Insight profiler that I that I talked about earlier in, in regards to the roofline uh, performance modeling. Um, we have a really growing segment of our user base that is using Python. Um, and so uh, through collaboration with, uh, with NVIDIA and HPE, we've been working to uh, make sure that getting, um, you know, performant Python acceleration with the GPUs is, is, is available on the system. And uh, here are some of the libraries that you can use to do that, um, in, including PyTorch and TensorFlow again for AI or machine learning applications. Um, and I, I might just skip this slide, I think, because I think uh, Helen mentioned it in, in her deck but really quickly uh, you can definitely run Jupyter notebooks on Perlmutter in a whole bunch of different configurations including um, you know a, a shared CPU node or exclusive GPU um, uh, access as well uh, <clears throat> so as I said I think we've, we've we're trying to take this sort of pragmatic approach where we recognize that there's a lot of users out there who have existing GPU codes, and we want to kind of just meet them where they where they are and allow them to, to run those codes performantly on the system. Um, and we also want to, at the same time, promote some sort of performance portable programming models that we think will give your code a little bit more uh, longevity or long, kind of longer legs going forward. Um, and those include OpenMP, uh, you know, 4.5, 5.x support, um, as well as things like Cocos, which um, are big investments within the DOE to allow C++ applications to run on CPUs and GPUs from multiple vendors um, and, and also into the, into the future. So our strategy has really been uh, as I said, to kind of support all those major programming models and languages, um, to also uh, pre-install 
optimized versions of many of your kind of favorite applications. Um, you know, particularly in the material science and chemistry space, there are a lot of shared applications, codes like VASP and LAMPS, which we talked about, and Quantum Espresso, um, as well as um, working with the vendors to kind of make the process of understanding your performance on GPUs something that is a little bit more tractable. And, um, you know, I just want to highlight again how I think how useful these GPU hackathons can be. If you go to gpuhackathons.org, <laughs> again, you can register for an upcoming an upcoming event. Um, so we, uh, in particular, have kind of invested some of our own um, time and resources into um, enabling uh, a couple performance portable programming models. The one that I really want to highlight here is OpenMP uh, 4.5 and 5.x, which uh, has gained uh, accelerator support in the NVIDIA HPC compiler stack because of NERSC's uh, collaboration with, with NVIDIA. Um, <clears throat> what we did was we kind of settled on a well-defined subset of the OpenMP standard for optimized GPU acceleration. And this has now been released in production in the NVIDIA compiler stack that is available on Perlmutter. So you can basically use it, use it today. Um, and so I will close here, I think, with just maybe a couple examples um, or science examples from, from Perlmutter. I know that I'm just about out of time here. So I'll maybe just do one, one or two. Um, so this is actually an application that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, this is a material science application where um, the goal here is to kind of help design potential future qubits um, for like a quantum, com quantum computer in complex um, materials that have some sort of defect in them. So in this, in this case, the defect is what's called a die vacancy. So essentially two atoms are removed from the, the crystal and to understand the kind of quantum states around that, that defect. Um, and so to do that, they needed this, this team needed to simulate sort of unprecedented simulation sizes with, a th with thousands of, of atoms. And uh, kind of here you can see some of the, some of the results. Um, you can see uh, kind of performance improvements as the GPUs um, have evolved into the final GPU part for, uh, for Perlmutter. Um, and you can see the, um, uh, the, the scaling to essentially uh, a full GPU system like, uh, like um, Perlmutter in the, in, in the plot above. Um, Another example is uh, exabiome. Uh, so this is a metagenomics code where they basically take and analyze the genome of an entire like population from a um, you know could could be like a sort of like a, a chunk of dirt or inside the gut of a of an animal, and there's um, kind of a thriving ecosystem of different types of like viruses, bacteria that you find, and they want to kind of um, sequence that entire population. Um, and so they have a lot of uh, sort of challenging operations to separate, analyze, and assemble that, uh, that genome. Um, and you can see that even with a um, set of work that isn't kind of immediately amenable to GPUs, um, they've been able to make significant uh, Im improvements. And what you're seeing here is a comparison of the CPU versus the GPU performance on, um, on Perlmutter for, for their particular algorithms. Um, and I think maybe, I'll, let's see if I'll, I'm just gonna highlight uh, maybe one more here, which is some of the early successes we've had working with different facilities um in particular 
uh, some of the light sources and the uh, kind of astrophysics or observational facilities. Um, this includes the LCLS at uh, Stanford and the uh, NCEM here at Berkeley Lab and the uh, dark energy spectroscopic instrument DESI um, and the, the LZ project as well. All of these teams are kind of up and running on on Perlmutter and have sort of stories that you can read about on our on our on our website. So I will I'll end there and I can uh, kind of take any questions or since I'm over time, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I can answer them in the in the doc as well.